There's something both primal and ancient about mountains. Beautiful and remote, they can provide a harsh and unforgiving environment for those who venture into their territory. Sometimes linked with sleeping giants, mountains are also a reminder of the Earth's formation, with rock contorted into fantastic shapes by immense geological pressures. The Cheviot Hills that run from Northumberland and cross into the Scottish borders are no exception. The highest of the hills is the Cheviot, which stands at 815 metres, and the Hen Hole lies to the northwest side of the Cheviot, which you might remember from my Dancing Fairies episode. This is a region that has seen bloodshed through battles in 1388, 1402 and 1464, among others. It's also an ancient and mostly untouched landscape, so it's hardly surprising you'd find legends of fairies and other supernatural folk up here, which is what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are returning to the usual type of episodes that I was doing before Magical October, although I have had a lot of very positive feedback about Magical October, so I will no doubt run another one like that in the future. And I hope that you did go off and check out all of the fabulous magical practitioners that I interviewed, because they're all absolutely fantastic people, and go and learn more about them. So we are heading into Folklore of Mountains and Hills Month, which was a listener request, but it is worth pointing out that I do already have episodes on the Grey Man of Ben McDewey in Scotland and the Simon Side Durgar, which was, oh god, that was a while ago now. I do, however, have bonus episodes about the Brocken, which was home of the Valpurgis Act Revels and the Hexenkopf in Pennsylvania, available to Patreon supporters, so I won't be covering either of those during this month on the main podcast. But as I say in the introduction, we are going to start with the Cheviot Hills, mostly because I'm a little bit biased, because obviously they're the ones nearest me, but also because they give you a really nice balance of different types of folklore so you've got legends about actual people you've got fairies you've got ghosts all that kind of lovely stuff so I thought it was worth including all of those to start things off but I also wanted to introduce a new feature inspired by of all things Sesame Street so do you remember how episodes would be brought to you by letters and numbers well in the fashion of the language of flowers because we all know how fascinated I am by that these episodes are going to be brought to you by a particular plant. Now, I am using Mrs. Burke's 1858 book, The Illustrated Language of Flowers, for the definitions, which you can find on archive.org. And this episode is therefore brought to you by spruce pine, which represented hope in adversity, something which I do think we could all do with right now. But anyway, on to the Cheviots. One of the things that's really fascinating about the Cheviots is we actually sort of know which deities the Celtic inhabitants of the area favoured. Now, remember that this particular part of the British Isles can claim Celtic ancestry due to its proximity to Scotland. And as it is, Scotland only relinquished its claim to Northumberland in 1237. So I think when we do talk about the Celtic nations, and obviously we include like Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Brittany, the Isle of Man, that kind of thing... Really, Northumberland does have a, a shout at being included as well, because obviously, let's remember, Hadrian thought that we were certainly part of Scotland when he put the wall in. But anyway, as William Young points out, thanks to the presence of nearby Hadrian's wall, the Romans wrote about the native gods they encountered. And as I say again and again on this podcast, a lot of what we know about the Celts comes from what the Romans wrote about them. And as an example, Young explains that the Roman soldiers believed either Sylvanus Cochidius or Mars Cochidius ruled the moors and forests of the Cheviots. Now, I've covered both Mars and Sylvanus before as Roman deities, but here they're linked with the native Celtic Cachidius. Jung suggests that Cachidius may have had a warlike aspect, which would explain his connection to Mars, yet the wilderness associated with Sylvanus may also have played a role in Cachidius' story. And in this way, either Mars Cachidius or Sylvanus Cachidius then becomes quite a localised god of the wilderness. Now, I do highly recommend Jung's Guide to the Cheviots for the exceptional photographs and detailed discussion of the history and available walks, and I will link that in the show notes below. But I also can't help thinking that Mars Cachidius would be absolutely fascinated, or he would be completely bemused, by the nearby location of the military firing range at Otterburn. So we're going to go from one extreme to the other now. So that's 
one of the local deities who we do know about. And obviously there's other Celtic deities that we know about. Obviously there's my long-term friend, Antinachiticus, who I've mentioned before, who's obviously actually based in Newcastle. But we've also got Coventina, whose well is right next to the Mithraeum up at Carabret near Hadrian's Wall. So actually near Sycamore Gap, actually. And again, we know about them because the Romans interacted with them. So in some ways, it's like, thanks for that. That's actually really helpful. But anyway, we're going to move on to a legend associated with an actual person, which I know obviously sometimes when I've covered folklore on the podcast in the past, there's definitely been a focus on like ghosts and fairies and witches and so on. And there's so many legends as well about the weird things that ordinary people did or the somewhat legendary feats that ordinary people did. So this particular legend... We're not necessarily sure how true it is, but it involves the shenanigans of smuggling, which obviously we have encountered on the podcast before. Now, smugglers actually carry two main products across the Cheviot Hills, and in some cases they actually used the Cheviots as a hiding place. And these two products were whiskey and salt. And as it is, there's apparently a path among the hills near Newton Tors called Salter's Path in reference to this lost history. But whiskey is the subject of this particular legend, and it's actually related by M.A. Richardson in his Borderers Table Book of 1846. So towards the end of the 18th century, apparently there were few excise officers along the border, which made it a lot easier for Scottish whiskey to find its way into England. And one such smuggler was Donald MacDonald, who originally came from the Highlands. He finally decided to forego the exciting life of a smuggler to distill his own whiskey. And considering the fact that it was actually illegal to do this, he's basically choosing a slightly more sedate form of illicit activity at this point. Now, he had apparently done so successfully in the hills around Inverness, so he assumed he could just replicate the process in the Cheviots. And he finally chose a spot for this illicit enterprise and before long had his illegal still up and running. Now, apparently his product became so beloved in the neighbourhood that neighbours would drop by at all hours to sample his wares. Now, Donald didn't really want to risk earning their ill will because he did sort of rely on staying on the good side, essentially for their protection. But he also knew that they were drinking his profits. So he had to try and work out what on earth he was going to do about this situation. One afternoon, a stranger arrived on horseback and Donald easily discerned that this man was going to want to sample the whiskey. So he actually laid out a spread of like bread and cheese and so on for him as well. Now, after a little bit of to and fro the man finally admitted that actually no, he was an excise officer and he turned up to try and arrest Donald. Now, obviously, Donald wasn't very happy about this, as you can imagine, and an argument ensued. And Donald got the excise officer to actually admit that no one had seen him come in. As Donald pointed out, if that was the case, no one would say that he hadn't left either. So he drew a pistol and a sword and levelled them at the excise officer. Now, the officer wasn't really sure how to handle this particular change in events because I don't actually think he was necessarily expecting it because Donald had really played the role of quite a meek and mild host. So he just helped himself to more bread, cheese and whiskey, apparently, as he's trying to think about what to do. But he actually ended up helping himself to so much whiskey that he then passed out on Donald's bed. Now, Donald didn't actually want to kill the officer, so rather than slaying him while he slept, instead, he then borrowed the officer's horse. And I love this bit, because while the excise officer is sleeping, Donald moves his entire still to a safe location. So by the time the officer then wakes up with a somewhat sore head the next day, he discovers that Donald has gone, the still has gone, and his horse has gone, and all that remains is the hut that he's been sleeping in. He does finally manage to make his way back to the path and manages to get back to civilization as well, obviously unharmed other than his rage and hangover, but he musters a force to accompany him to arrest Donald. But the trouble is when they get back to the spot, everything is gone and he has no idea where Donald and the still have gone. And the only thing that remains is Donald has given him his horse back, so the horse is just kind of standing there like, hello. And he's also left a barrel of whiskey for the arresting company, which as far as the story goes, everybody rather enjoyed. Now, as far as we know, no one ever did manage to arrest Donald MacDonald, but he has become somewhat of a local legend because of the way he essentially takes advantage of an opportunity in order to just simply move and disappear off into the wilderness of the Cheviot. There's no more mention of people continuing to bother him for his wares, so it's entirely possible that this allowed him to solve that problem as well. But I have mentioned fairies a few times and it wouldn't be Northumbrian folklore without a mention of either kings of old or fairies. And the small town of Wooler actually lies at the base of the Cheviots and has both. It's often sometimes referred to as the gateway of the Cheviots. And a footpath from the town heads up the hill towards the Pinwell and the King's Chair. 
and you nearly always see these talked about together. So the king's chair is a large rock that actually juts out of the hill above the well. It apparently takes its name from a king who sat here while his army fought a battle below. Naturally, some people say that the king was Arthur, but there's not really any evidence to actually suggest that to be the case. And obviously, we do have the link between Arthur and the North East through the fact that the place where he's supposed to be sleeping until he's needed is under Sewing Shields Castle in Northumberland. But as it is, nobody actually knows the name of the king, the time of the battle, or even who was fighting. So it's a little bit difficult to know what's going on there, but it's a really good example of a legend becoming attached to a natural feature which almost explains its shape. The pin well, on the other hand, sometimes known as the fairy's well, is formed of large granite stones that create like a rough basin and obviously gathers water. And apparently you can see a collection of crooked pins at the bottom. And according to Francis Francis, writing in 1874, the pins are, and I quote, in every state of preservation, end quote. Now, as the belief goes, you could essentially bend a pin and drop it into the well while making your wish. And this is why the pins are like really super old and a bit rusty and then a lot newer as well, because people have been doing this for a really long time. Now, the crooked pin, therefore, acted like an offering to the fairies who would hopefully grant said wish. Now, Francis suggests that young women hoping for a partner most often made use of this particular practice. Meanwhile, local artist Louise A. Tolson adds that locals did this on May Day every year, which makes it more of a ritualistic behaviour. It is actually something that you find associated with a range of wells, which are usually linked with some kind of healing. So people would leave the pins as an offering, as they did at the Loch Shianta Spring on Skye. And meanwhile, at the Well of St John at Mount Grace Priory in North Yorkshire, people would actually stick a pin through an ivy leaf before floating it on the water to make their wishes. Leaves that floated meant the wish would come true, while leaves that sank meant the wish would go ungranted. So it's quite interesting to see that particular piece of folklore continuing at this well up in the Cheviots. But I did think that we would close with ghosts because we've already had a local legend, fairies, well, we've also had a Celtic god and a potential link with King Arthur. So why not have a look at the supernatural in a more classical sense? Well, the A68 crosses the Cheviots into Scotland and the road takes us through the Carter Bar Pass. The name actually refers to a long gone toll gate with the area originally known as the Reeds Wire. In the days when the marchers stretched along both sides of the border, providing the so-called debatable lands of the border reavers, and I will cover this in a bit more depth at some point, I think, because it is really important history, Carter Bar actually played a really important role in the area, because the march wardens held true stays here where they conducted business related to the border, such as justice or compensation for raids. Now, in 1575, the wardens met for a typical true stay on 7th of June. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the meeting ended up descending into violence. Scottish reinforcements arrived, sending the English south in defeat, and the event became known as the Raid of the Reedswire. Yet one of the Englishmen, a man named Thomas Ellisden, apparently never left the site. Beheaded by a Scottish claymore, his ghost seemingly still wanders the moors at the site, and considering there's now a car park there where people like to get out and take photos of the view, kind of at this point, which like really does mark the border, apparently this ghost has been seen numerous times. But he's not the only ghost in the area, and I wanted to include this one because he's a little bit different from the normal type of ghosts that you come across on podcasts. And this one's linked to the Catclough Reservoir, which lies some 2.6 miles to the southeast of Carter Bar. It's literally just down the road. And this is the ghost of Percy Reed, a 15th century landowner at nearby Trough End. Known for his honesty and fighting prowess, he became one of the border wardens. During his tenure, he saw several reavers from the notorious Crozier clan meet their end on the gallows. The Croziers, rather than mending their ways, vowed vengeance and enlisted Reed's neighbours, the Halls, to help them. So one day the Halls invited Reed to go hunting with them, and having no reason to suspect them of treachery, Reed agreed. He walked into the Crozier ambush and the Reavers hacked Reed to pieces. The locals then shunned the halls for their part in the affair because it sounds like Reed was actually quite well liked in the area. But people started seeing Reed's ghost on the moor near his home and in the valley where we now find the reservoir. In some sightings he wears a green hunting coat and sounds his horn as if he's still hunting in the area whereas in other sightings he wears the clothes of a 15th century gentleman. And this is where he's a bit more unusual, because by all accounts he's actually considered quite friendly and approachable, and in the past he's even helped lost travellers find the road again, and I quite love the idea that given what happened to him, it's quite touching that he's retained his good humour in death, and I think this is one of the reasons why he ended up being 
I don't want to say popular, but like a well-liked ghost in the area because he wasn't causing any bother for anyone. He's actually quite helpful to have around. But I just thought that that said a lot about his character more than anything else. But ultimately, in many ways, I think the folklore of the Cheviots reflects the nature of the place. And the legend of Donald MacDonald speaks of ingenuity, wit and cunning, which are all qualities that would certainly serve you well in such a remote landscape. And indeed, it's an ideal location in which to find an ancient god of the wilderness. Meanwhile, the King's Chair speaks of battles of a bygone age, reflecting the bloodshed and violence of the later fighting of the Reavers. The Pinwell reminds us of the presence of the Fair Folk in these primal landscapes, and if we believe the legends, we also find them making music at Hen Hall. Now, I do recommend visiting the Cheviots if you get the chance, but do remember the basics. Know how to read a map in case your technology fails. Check the weather before you go. Wear sturdy boots, the right clothing, and let someone know where you're going. And maybe keep an offering for the fairies with you, just in case. So I hope that you enjoyed that particular episode. I really enjoyed doing the research, but let's be honest, I am kind of biased towards the Northeast. I really, really love the folklore and just the history up here. And I think that it's a part of the country that possibly gets overlooked a little bit because of the fact that obviously, as far as England's concerned, we're so far north. And because this particular area is really, really remote and in a lot of cases kind of empty, because of that military firing range. I think a lot of these places, you know, walkers love them, but they don't really necessarily get as much coverage as they should. But anyway, I haven't decided what I'm going to have a look at next week yet. So please get your requests in. Do remember, as I said, I've already got the Brocken, I've already got the Hexen Cop, I've already got the Grey Man of Ben McDewey. So anything like that, I'm not going to cover again. And if you are interested in the Brocken or the Hexen Cop, then as I say, they are bonus episodes available to Patreon supporters at the 350 a month or more tier. So you're more than welcome to sign up and look at the something like 47 bonus episodes or something ridiculous that I've currently got there now. And otherwise, yeah, drop your request in and I'll see you next week. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.